Hi, everybody. It's great to be here. So, as George was saying, my name is Alex Beard, and I started out life 12 years ago as a teacher. And as a teacher, I became interested in the idea that our schools seem to exist in the past, where the world around us was changing very rapidly. So I set off in search of what the future of education might be, what we should be learning today, how we might learn it, and what role things like AI might play in the future. And in that journey, I had the opportunity to meet with some incredible people and talk to these leading thinkers from all over the world. And I couldn't think of three better people um, from all of my travels for us to have on this panel today to talk about AI and education, and particularly to talk about uh, the ethical implications of using AI in education. So we're gonna have a fantastic panel discussion for the next 40 minutes or so. I'm gonna do some very brief introductions of our panelists um, and then give them an opportunity to introduce themselves. But we'll be exploring this question of um, ethics and AI. If AI is gonna influence the future of education, um, what should we be concerned about from an ethical point of view? So first up with our panel today, we have the amazing uh, Priya Lakhani, who's a barrister and entrepreneur who founded the amazing Century Tech um, back in 2013, um, having seen underachievement rates um, in schools. And Priya has now become a speaker about AI and education. She's the co-founder of the Institute for Ethical AI and Education um, and is very busy uh, right now with a lot of work. Um, as kids around the world are using her platform um, to access education through this crisis. So Priya, we're really glad to have you. Thank you. Um, thanks for being here. Second up, we have uh, Sir Anthony Selden, who is the Vice Chancellor at the University yeah. of Buckingham and is one of Britain's leading contemporary historians, educationalists, commentators and political authors. He's a real polymath who's written 40 books he served as a, a transformative head teacher for 20 years um, and is, among many, many other things, uh, an expert both in happiness and in AI and education. So very, very pleased to have you with us, uh, Anthony. Thanks, and finally, um, I'd like to welcome Graham Brown Martin, who is an author and educator um, and founder of Learning Without Frontiers, which is a global community that brings together educators, technologists and creatives to think about what the future uh, might look like and perhaps um, create it. He wrote a brilliant book called Learning Reimagined, um, which I urge everyone to re read. And he's the founder of beyondtomorrow.global and regenerative.global. Welcome, Graham. So thank you Hi. all for joining us. And to get started, um, before we get into the, the big questions, I'd love it if you could each just take a couple of minutes to introduce yourselves and your work as it relates to AI and education, and maybe just share what you think is the big, biggest ethical question that we face with um, AI and education today. And Priya, do you mind starting us off? Yeah, not at all. Thank you, Alex. Uh, it's great to be on this panel. Thank you. Uh, so I'm the founder and chief executive of Century Tech. So we've built a, a very sort of premium uh, learning, teaching and learning platform, which is used in schools globally. Um, obviously, adoption of the platform has increased since COVID and since lockdown of schools. Um, it's an AI, and the word AI is often quite loosely used. It's a it's a machine that uses machine learning and also deep learning um, to learn how children learn. It then uh, provides a personalised learning journey for children and insights to educators and parents and the children themselves to increase agency in learning. It's been going for a few years now. It takes a while to build an AI, um, and we work with educators, um, you know, students around the world. Some of the best schools in the world use the platform and have been doing so for, for years as well as some of the most challenged schools and so um, I've had uh, the privilege of working with thousands and thousands of educators and students and also dealing with parents as well and it's taught me a lot about uh, the world of education having been immersed in it for so long I also taught for a couple of years which, which was helpful uh, it, for my role now but what I've really learned in terms of sort of the question about ethics is that I think there, there are so many issues and um, Sir Anthony and I, with Professor Rose Lacking, co-founded the Institute for Ethical AI, to try and build a global council 
that could then consider all of the issues to do with ethics and AI from algorithm bias all the way to accessibility. But at the moment, I think with COVID, one of the key issues is, and, and I think it is an ethical issue, is about access. Um, it's about access of the technology to to all children. I mean, if we can get past, you know, what it's doing and what it's been programmed to do, um, you know, what worse that could happen? A child is given decimals in math rather than Pythagoras' theorem. I mean, it, there's all of these issues that we need to talk about. Um, safeguarding, ensuring the safety, ensuring where your data is going to be in privacy. Um, but with AI, there is this real problem where we may end up exacerbating the attainment gap, where we may end up, we want to level the playing field. We want everyone to achieve the best education we don't want to bring that down in any way but at the same time if technology is augmenting the teachers if it's improving outcomes across the board by a significant amount if it's allowing children to learn at home autonomously while we're in lockdown in certain parts of the world and others are not able to learn at all because of infrastructure issues as well as the fact that maybe that te particular technology has not been adopted you know what does that mean in terms of uh, what's going to happen in the next few years when we measure the gap in attainment, particularly between disadvantaged children and their peers. Their peers being children where parents are tech savvy, they have time, they have money, they're able to go and source technologies, put them in front of their children, buy them the brand new iPad or a tablet, whatever it is, with 5G, etc. I think that's a huge ethical issue that we have to look at in general. Obviously, there are many, many more, but that's something that I'm particularly concerned about at the moment, given that COVID has accelerated the adoption of this personalised intelligent technology. Thanks so much, Priya. Um, so, Anthony, could you uh, maybe introduce yourself to the audience as well? So hello everybody and thank you very much for uh, logging into this. Hope you get something from it. I uh, have, as you heard, spent my life in, in schools uh, all the way from children down to three up to 18. Was head of two different schools for 20 years and now I've been running a university for five years. Uh, so that's interesting because it gives me a, a broad sweep of, of ages and there are many, to answer the question Alex, there are many, I believe, more benefits from AI as long as we get ahead of the ethical issues than there are risks. But there are very considerable risks. Priya was talking about risks to accelerating social mobility and COVID has shown uh, the livid social mobility uh, gap in educational um, educational entitlement uh, uh, and educational delivery at the moment uh, between the better off and least well off in our society, which is unacceptable. AI could accelerate that. There are very significant privacy issues. But to pick something else, Alex, I would say um, infantilization. Now, uh, AI is going to transform education and it's going to transform the world that we're educating people for, society and jobs. Uh, the risk that we see in many jobs, uh, we see it in taxi drivers, in London black cab drivers, and years learning the knowledge. Now the knowledge is worse than useless. Uh, it, it, it's not just useless, it's worse than useless because However bright uh, a taxi driver might have come top of the entire um, uh, thousands of London taxi uh, drivers on the knowledge, it will never tell them that there is a, um, a, a spill in the next week and therefore they need to take a detour. Um, and so uh, the taxi driver wants a great source of professional pride. Now the knowledge is useless. Um, I was chatting to an airline pilot uh, just the month before lockdown when planes were still flying. And I said, you know, that must be fascinating to do. And he said, no, not really. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I'm just really a, a clerk. I just sit in my seat and everything is done for me. And we are in the merest foothills of the foothills of AI. How many other jobs, including teacher jobs, are going to be infantilized where the, you know, the, 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 the stuff of life, life becomes meaningful for all of us when we have challenges 
and we rise to uh, 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 and we meet those challenges. I mean, that's when life becomes really rich and rewarding. If AI is going to take all that away from us, if AI is going to do the hard stuff of learning uh, for the students, if it's going to do the hard stuff of of teaching for the teachers, uh, the hard stuff of research for academics at my university and elsewhere, well, what is the point? So infantilization, Alex, would be my numero uno. Thank you, Saransk. And we'll come back to all of these topics in our discussion shortly. Um, Graham, can I hand it over to you? Sure, thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for inviting me along and thank you for coming to this session. Um, so I've been a bit long in the tooth, really. Um, you know, I've had a 30 plus year career um, generating fast growth startups in the education, technology and um, entertainment sectors. But going back, I mean, I've been working with EdTech since the early 1980s, uh, I'm that old, um, initially with the Open University, um, working on some of the very first online learning systems um, and teaching systems. But during that time, during the early 80s, I also had the opportunity to work uh, briefly with a gentleman called Seymour Papert, uh, an AI pioneer and learning theorist from MIT. Um, Papert had been a student of Piaget and building on Piaget's theory of constructivism, which could be best described as learning by doing, he established his own theory, constructionism, um, essentially learning by making, when as part of a collaborative activity, the learner experiences as constructing a meaningful product is a sort of more effective way of learning. This idea of applying knowledge um, and demonstrating transference by creating something new. Interestingly, and I think it's opposite to the conversation that we may have today, Papert believed that the arrival of the microcomputer as a tool for learning would could allow learners to pursue independent inquiry and thus cut across curriculums, you know, segregation by age, place and space, as well as uniformity of what children learn. Unfortunately, you know, in the 90s, he later lamented that computers in schools had become subsumed into reinforcing schools' ways. Sort of today, you can see how we are using 21st century technology and maybe even AI to reinforce um, 20th century teaching practice or 19th century ideas around education and instruction. Um, Today, I think we're on the precipice of such technological potential. There's a potential that we, there's a possibility we may continue down that path, and that worries me. And I wonder whether we should be looking anew um, at what kind of education present and future generations may need as a result of this technological progress. In terms of ethical concerns, I think there are many, and, and both the other my fellow panelists have mentioned some of them, and I can only agree. I think algorithmic bias, I think, and the lack of representation, you know, we're seeing that already. I mean, just in the way that search engines work and so forth, there's the possibility that in building knowledge sets and heuristics, we may calcify uh, cultural norms. Um, and we're seeing some of that with the Black Lives Matter movement, for example, the lack of representation, and we calcify bias into heuristics in the way that they are in search engines. I think we could be in a lot of trouble. Um, I think I, I, just to jump on the point that um, Anthony Seldon made about the, the knowledge uh, and that memorization of, 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 of street route, routes around London and so forth, I think that does ask questions about learning and, and, and how we perform education, particularly in the face of AI. Is it literally about memory and memorizing things for a, a test? Or can we now do something else? Does AI liberate us to do something else? So I think another ethical question is not so much linked to AI, but more about what we think education is um, and what education is for. I just, Thank you, just, Graham. Can I just say I totally agree with Graham. Um, and to make a point I made earlier, we have a pretty good education pretty good education system if very uneven 
at schools and colleges and universities in Britain. It's a pretty good education system for the 20th century, preparing people for the 20th century using 20th century technology. And Graham is absolutely right. The system prioritizes um, uh, learning of data. It could be telephone directories uh, often that you regurgitate in exams. There's very little uh, deep learning, holistic learning, and broad intelligence learning. The, the range of human intelligence is that the conventional factory model of education focuses on and Graham has enlightened so much in his own work is very narrow. Mm. AI will change that, can change that. Well, and actually, that's where I wanted to start. I don't know if, just before we go into those ethical issues that you have raised, if somebody would like to summarise for our audience the potential benefits of applying AI in education, just to set the scene before then we look at some of these risks and opportunities that we need to tackle. Do you want to Yeah, go for it. Yeah, I'll just jump in there. One. I mean, I think it's. I think it's. Interesting. It goes back to what I was raising earlier, and 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 Anthony's picked up on. Um, you know, just what what it's for. Now, you know, in the summer of last year, uh, computer scientists made a um, you know reached a particular milestone. It was fabulous. It was the 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 taught an AI to pass an eighth grade science test. Um, now, this is it's genuine. Um, milestone because it's not only a standardized test but it's also logic and so forth and of course the the write-ups and, and the sort of the narrative within the mainstream media the new york times for example was saying that well this was amazing that we could teach an ai to pass an eighth grade science test because you know this would help ais to teach children and i think this was a very woolly idea of for sort of fourth industrial um revolution type um technologies which was a viewing it through the sort of 20th century or second or third industrial revolution lens. What it didn't take into account was that actually an AI passing an eighth grade science test changes everything because it actually means that test is now obsolete. <coughs> and, and from my perspective, it's like, look, take your AIs, teach them all of those standardized tests, put, get them to talk to each other. Because rather than taking eight years to get a kid to pass an eighth grade test, a, a machine can teach another machine in, in a matter of seconds. Um, now, tell me what I have to learn. And this isn't, this isn't, I'm not suggesting that we infantilize by not learning knowledge and, and, and understanding, but, but let's move ourselves forward. What would a science test look like um, if a child had access to the AI? You know, it strikes me as 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 bizarre that the benefits that we could get from AI aren't realized in the same way that the benefits of the internet and other technologies aren't realized. Because when you go into an examination room um, in a school, for example, you see signs outside saying no twenty, no twenty first century allowed. No phones, no watches, no laptops, no internet, no collaboration. You're not allowed to share your answers. Why wouldn't you share your answers? What are we testing? If we're actually looking at a workforce for the future, if we're looking at um, a generation that can solve phenomenal challenges, then surely we need to be valuing something else. And so I think that the benefits of AI, and there are many, and I'm sure we'll talk about them, will not be realized if we're not allowed to use them at the point of assessment. So, Alex, to, to talk about some of the... Um... The, the benefits of what, what it can actually do. Um, so AI is that is the machine, and I know we're at COGEX, so we have lots of data scientists and engineers who are experts at this, but just for the benefit of everyone, um, it, the difference is it's a machine that can learn autonomously, right? It learns by itself, it can make decisions, it can recommend to you, just like, for example, in education, there's a lot more nuance than this, by the way, but for example, when you're shopping on Amazon or Netflix or searching on Google when, you know, your, the entry that you want basically comes up. It's learning by itself what people mean when they ask a certain question, what people like based on previous uh, preferences. It's looking at patterns and correlations. It can look at content. It can look at the actual words of the content and start to understand if you ask a question in a certain way in education, this is how the majority of boys who are dyslexic from the south of England will answer the question versus girls who go to independent schools in the north of England. It can, it can look at patterns and correlations. It can then start to learn by itself links between content. 
And this this technology already exists today, and it's used throughout the world in in thousands of schools. And so the benefit of the technology, why you would use it, is if you think about everybody who's watching, who's at home right now, you know, who's maybe got kids or uh, godchildren or nieces and nephews who are at home during lockdown, right? If you think about when they were at school before or when they're maybe on Microsoft Teams or Zoom with their teachers now, we're used to seeing that one size fits all delivery of education. And it's not a teacher's fault. No teacher came to teaching badly, um, but teachers are forced to deliver a lesson to 30 children. They're forced to the didactic sort of methodology of, you know, teaching and learning where you're standing chalk and talk in the front, right? And you're doing that because you have a curriculum to deliver that's really, really large within a short period of time to 30 children, 30 students with erratic personalities, where there's potentially a huge range of ability within that particular class of 30 children, even if you stream them, even if you stream them into top sets and lower sets in maths and English and science, you still have a range of ability. The teacher has to deliver that lesson. That one size fits all we know is inadequate. It's how we were taught, it's how our grandparents were taught. The first university centuries ago had that one size fits all delivery method. With an AI, which is not a platform, it's not a learning app, it's not a maths app where you can just log in and if a hundred of you do different things, you still have the same experience. With an AI, by tracking how you're learning, learning links between content, learning how the individual is interacting with the content. What an AI can do is it can personalize for the student. And this is where it's really powerful. You can have a student who's struggling with Pythagoras' theorem, right? And there could be two students struggling with completely different areas. Let's say it's Graham and Anthony, right? A machine will be able to tell within seconds. Okay, Graham might not be understanding Pythagoras because he doesn't understand roots and powers in maths. It can then give him the roots and powers. Let's say it's Anthony. Anthony's actually understanding Pythagoras. But actually, he's a foreign language speaker. He doesn't speak English very well. And he's got a literacy level issue in English. De Anthony, it's definitely you that I'm talking about her. <laughs> anyway, and Alex is a genius, right? Alex is doing really, really well with Pythagoras. And therefore, he wants to move him on. I know you're all cross with my design here, but I'm just doing it anyway because it's fun. And I have the floor, right? So let's say that's the case. So let's say we now go on to another topic, right? And we go on to, and, and so a machine that can differentiate for each student is really powerful because education, one bit four, Graham and Anthony, if they ask that question, in fact, every panel I sit on with these guys, we're always asking the same question, aren't we? What is it for, right? What do we want from education, from formal education particularly? And so when we think about differentiating for each student, we all know too well those stories about children who get stuck. And when you get stuck, it's really, we've all been there, right? It's not a nice experience. We know children who get bored. A system that can actually differentiate for the child, doesn't allow them to get stuck, moves them on, but uses elements of neuroscience as well. So what do we know about cognitive load? What do you know about working memory, right? Why, <laughs> they all want to say things now. Okay, <laughs> I've got the power, men. Okay, you're going to let me speak. So, um, a system can then differentiate. The point is it can differentiate. If you're a publisher, what can AI do? What's the benefit for a publisher of content, for a teacher producing content? Wouldn't you like to know which of the kids are engaged and why? Would you like to know if the question is actually testing the skill? Graham talks about regurgitation of facts. He's right. A lot of questions that we see are testing recall, right, which a machine can do. How many questions are we asking children day in, day out that are testing deduction, inference, analytical problem solving? How to actually, if you had an AI in the future in front of you, how could you then leverage that to use your human intelligence combined with your AI? But an AI can actually analyze the content in a nanosecond and provide that analysis. So there are lots of benefits. I haven't even touched on the big data analytics because with AI you have big data, so you have analysis for educators. But you know, at Century, we see these and we see them in practice every single day. It is really important to talk about the risks and the challenges. It's important to preempt those, absolutely, because we don't want to be chasing up our afterwards and saying that, you know, potentially there are companies out there that are making recommendations when it comes to jobs, right? And it's not offering the right job opportunities to every person based on you know, ethnicity or race, you know, or gender, etc. But the fact is, is that AI and learning, you know, we've seen transformative impact. And with home learners, you know, school people with their, as I said, their kids or got kids at home, etc. You're able to see children learn autonomously themselves with a the machine. You have to sit with them all day, and you can see massive benefits. And that's really that is an ethical point as well. And we talk about that a lot at the Institute of Ethical AI because you have to highlight the opportunities and the benefits. And then you have to look at the risks and the challenges. And it's always got to be a very, very sort of healthy balance between the two. Mm. And uh, so Anthony, both 
Priya and Graham, I think, have said things which perhaps connect to your point about infantilization. Like on the one hand, it seems like avoiding infantilization has something to do with equipping humans with the tools to use. And in Graham's example, we're sort of having AI as something that we use creatively, we sort of understand, we build on. What would you say to, in response to their points? Does Graham going to go first or, or me? You can go first, Anthony. Right. I'm going to come to Graham. Two very, two very quick points. One, Alex, infantilization is a real risk, but the current system infantilizes uh, and renders mentally incomplete um, our young people. One reason we have such high incidence of uh, mental unwellness is that young people have no idea who they are often because the education system is not interested in who they are or what their response is to this Shakespeare play or this uh, piece of music or uh, this um, biological problem. It's interested in them giving the right answer. And the, 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 so, so the, pre the present system infantilizes uh, without any uh, doubt. Uh, and then when we come on to the issue uh, of um, uh, looking at how uh, bias comes in, there's a real risk of AI and bias. This is my second point. But the current system is deeply biased. How many people listening to this, and by the way, apologies about my screen. I can't do anything uh, about that. How many of you uh, listening to this, uh, looking at it, were in uh, the lower stream at school? Or how many of you have children in lower streams, lower sets? How many of you are middle uh, or your children? How many in upper? These things are cruel, self-fulfilling prophecies. You tell a child in the factory, which is the current model of education that we have, that they are lower stream and they think I'm thick and, and they no longer want to listen. They're, they're no longer incentivized to believe that they can do it. If they are middle, they think, well, they're just average, you know, and I can't do that. I can't do this, I can't paint, I can't uh, learn this, I'll never be any good at languages or at English or at maths. Uh, they are cruel biases in the current system. And again, AI, while not being free of bias, actually allows each and every student to shine to the limit of their own capability, including uh, Graham's got a Black Lives Matter um, uh, sticker above him, including the system that so um, uh, uh, demotivates and fails to bring the best out of, particularly between between year seven and year 13, between 11 and 18 year olds for BAME children. AI would do so much uh, once we properly implement it to, to let them fulfill their own potential in their own way. Thank you, Sarantin. Greg, did you want to come in on that? Yeah, I just want to sort of t take a, maybe a step back because I think, in, and with all the greatest respects, obviously, to, 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 to Priya's work, um, I think there is this um, myth um, that's spread by technocrats and bureaucrats that computers can personalise learning. Um, they can't. Um, it, you know, personalisation isn't like recommendation engines that you have on Amazon or Spotify. Uh, Personalisation is where, um, it, you know, teaching and learning, it's relational. It's a relationship between um, a minimum of two people, perhaps more, what happens in the room. In fact, actually teaching could be regarded as co-learning um, in the same way that, for example, Paolo Ferrer in the Pedagogy of the Press was talking about the teacher becoming a co-learner. But the point is relational. Personalization happens when I know you, when I understand you, when I know what your passions and interests and changing talents are. That's how good teachers, good human teachers personalize. And I think we have to be really careful that we don't think that, that, that the AI does that. It might personalize in a very narrow um, track of where it wants to take you, which is if we're applying that technology to, for example, the 20th century classical module of education to get you through these tests, then it will just be doing that. But it's not really personalization. I think we have to be careful with the, the language of education being hijacked by technocrats um, and, and bureaucrats. And I think to another point, 
I think that we've, again, we, we talk about digital divides and we typically imagine that those digital divides are those that don't have access to high speed internet and computers and so forth. And, and that is quite right. But there is another kind of digital divide that might appear as a result of applying AI type technologies to education in the sense that the digital divide becomes when those that don't have access to a physical school, because what we're saying is actually we can't, you know, there's so many people that don't have access to education, take the African continent, for example, or the Indian subcontinent, but what we can do is distribute um, learning through these digital things. So you get a thin, narrow version of what education is because of AI. So I think we have to be mindful of, of, of these kinds of issues as well. So personalization and what we mean by digital divide, I think is is figurative here. I think, I, I, want to on that. I think no one's saying that that is what personalization is. I think that's just the, uh, that is uh, a simple, just defining the word there. I think it's, uh, no, that is making the assumption that, uh, as you say, technocrats are um, are suggesting that AI could replace teaching uh, and they can't. And, and I don't think, I mean, I never say that. In fact, I'm a huge advocate of saying it doesn't. It augments teaching and learning. It, it's a tool. It's simply a tool, just like a tool that I'm sure if you look around you in your room right now, there are, or in your house, there are a bunch of tools that you use to make your life easier. Um, and the problem right now in education, and we've had this for a long, long time, and it is just about time that it changes, is that teachers go in to do their day job to provide that one-to-one -one interaction. They want peer-to-peer -peer learning. They want kids to learn with each other. They want to teach skills. They want to teach empathy, right? In a world where social media has just gone wild, empathy is really, really important. Um, where children think it's okay just to text and send social media messages that are actually quite unkind without having to face the consequences in the playground like we used to, empathy is really important they want to teach 21st century skills where people talk about that a lot what does that mean you know and people say look it's uh, learning how to learn it's collaboration leadership proactivity that's the human side of things but how can teachers have the time to spend that time you know teaching all of these amazing skills the skills that is not just about you know trying to regurgitate what a map looks like that a machine can do if they don't have the time if 60 percent of a teacher's time is spent marking assessing doing admin they're not able to provide that, what I call, you're saying personalised, what I'm calling a holistic, wholesome education. The education that as a parent of two children, I want them to receive. I want them to be safe at school. I want them to be happy at school. And then I want that holistic education. That's that's the, the holy grail, right? And the thing is, is that most teachers have no time to do that. Their hands are tied behind their backs. So the idea is how can we provide tools and technologies that help? And when we use the word personalised, that, that word existed with, technology long before I even came into the mix right they were talking about adaptive personalized all these sorts of words and terms that are used and all you're saying and we're very 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 clear for example in literature that we use and other companies are very very clear it's actually what well, I get upset when people use personalized and it's a rules-based standard bog standard system that's not personalized whatsoever or you know but a system is where when Graham goes online and he studies and he has an experience on this system it will be different to Priya's and it will be different to Anthony's and it's going to be to Alex it is personal to him that's what the word means the word is not in any way suggesting this is your whole education system because it's not you know just because the fact that Eton uses century for example it doesn't mean that when I gave this system for free to the whole of Lebanon to 1.4 million children who are using it for free refugees are using it for free it doesn't mean they're getting an Eton education they're not right but it does mean that they now have access to top tier content the content that is then tailored and presented to them in a way that the student can then consume and digest. So that the student can then try and achieve mastery in that topic. That frees the teacher up to make timely targeted interventions. It frees the teacher up to say, Anthony was so right, and I'm so glad he mentions this. We don't talk about streaming and setting children enough. We talk about growth mindset. I know that's already become a controversial thing, but parents, I think, would agree that you like the fact that your, your own child has a growth mindset, whether or not the evidence is now saying if that's a fad or not. I don't, but I think Drex's work was spot on, right? But how can we now aid the teacher Teachers are basically given an impossible job in education. And these are tools that help them. So whichever words we're using, I think as long as technology companies are clear, and I mean, Graham and I have had these conversations years in the past about personalization. And I know you've worked for companies before that have done various things in these sorts of spaces. But the idea is let's look at the problem that educators, that stakeholders, that students, that parents are facing. How can we build a tool to try and help solve that problem? And when you're using technology, 
and you're giving everyone an individualized experience where their experience is different to someone else. And you're yeah, may I, may I comment? Nice. Yeah. On, on, sorry. Can I, oh, Graham, can I just, I'm just going to, I'm going to, we only have five minutes to go. So I'm going to, you definitely will have an opportunity to respond to Priya, but I'm just going to summarize where I think we've got to in this conversation and then invite some closing remarks. And you can go first, Graham, if that's all right. Uh, and you can respond well, to Priya. But I'm just going to say, yeah, so I, I think we've talked about, I'm going to say challenge, a few different challenges. One of access, but that's a complicated picture because it doesn't just mean access to technology. There may be access to different levels of quality of education, some which are machine only, some which involve humans. We've got a risk of infantilization, but actually that's something which has got a deeper rooted history in our education system as the way education operates. And there's a, a real risk of encoding current bad practices into the tools that we build. That seems important. There's the question of bias. There's the question of the extent to which personalization prevents you from accessing a full range of things that somebody brought up on the, on the chat here. So we face this, there's a question of privacy that we haven't really touched on. Can I invite you each to make one and a half minute closing remarks, just if, if you have one idea for what we need to do to ensure that we tackle some of these, one maybe one of these ethical issues, what that might be, as well, of course, as responding to Priya Graham. And um, you can go first. No, I mean, I, I you know, as, as Priya says, we have these debates and I, I, and it's great. It's, it's, it's really good. I mean, it's, it's, it's constructive. I think it's not sparring. Um, but I would just to bring up one point was that, you know, it, we, we could call AI at all, that's fine. Then we, what is, what is its purpose? I mean, we design tools and we design them to have a purpose. Now, we could think about the AI as a, the purpose of this is to get you through these tests and to get you know, and education as content. My suggestion is actually that's, that's no longer the case. Back to um, Anthony's point about the, the knowledge and memorization. How can we change the purpose of education? You know, at what point do we change? Um, the education system. What 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 point do we change? What and how we learn? Now, I accept that we can apply um, these wonderful tw advanced twenty first century technologies to this um, late nineteenth century, early twentieth century education model. But is that really what we should be doing at this point in history? And that's my point um, around the use of these particular particular tools. So we need to rethink education in order to use the. Well, I, I think, well. you know, look, we we here, I mean, if we look at the industrial strategy in the United Kingdom, for example, if we look at, you know, you can't, you know, you have to be in a cave to, 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 to learn about the fourth industrial revolution. We have got massive existential challenges, which we are going through at this moment. At what point do we change the education system? Mm -hmm. At what point do we have a public debate about what and how we learn? I mean, it's just, it just strikes me as inconceivable that we can continue. We've got these amazing technologies that Priya has been talking about and Anthony has been talking about, and yeah. yet we do not change. Anthony, what this would you insane. add? Uh, greatest risk, I agree with what Graham has said. Greatest risk is that we opt out of this and think that it's either too difficult, by the way, AI is, is not that difficult to understand, uh, that the um, the best minds have been excluded from education uh, for a very long time, perhaps ever. Um, it, it, education, what happens is decided by government who has rendered the KPIs uh, down to what can be measured with a very mean, I think inherently sexist and racist um, bias uh, in favour of a very limited kind of left brain cognitive skills uh, around um, uh, memory and some, and some logical uh, linguistic processes. Uh, we need to completely rethink uh, what education can be because it can and should be lifelong. It can and should be democratic for every single person. There can be an Eton or a Mossbourne Academy which is a, a, a state school uh, which does um, very well style, a quality of teaching for everybody. I mean, it could be so different and so incredibly joyful, uh, mentally healthy, stimulating, humane, civilized, green friendly, environmentally friendly and inclusive. 
if we get it right. Uh, but if we get it wrong, it will continue the narrowing down. Just last point, education means drawing out. It means leading out from what's inside us. But all too often, education is a narrowing down to a finishing point where people get, you know, four A stars at A level. Huh? I mean, what is the good of that? I mean, what is the good of that? And if AI just becomes, makes us even better at doing that, we failed, as Graham and Priya are saying. Well, thank you so much, um, Anthony and Graham and Priya. That was an alarmingly short amount of time to cover a very complex um, <laughs> issue, but you did so beautifully, um, fascinatingly, elegantly, um, and have given us all a lot to think about. So there's going to be a break now of 15 minutes and then a Q&A session. Want access to more COGX videos? Subscribe now for free at cogx.co.